Good. Good afternoon, everyone. So this is our microbial sequencing workshop. And as Jay mentioned, we are from Novogene. And so the purpose of this workshop is just to familiarize you, you guys with uh, different NGS technologies and workflows and give you some things to consider uh, uh, for, for doing your next NGS project. So we'll start out just by introducing ourselves. So my name is Andrew Albert. Uh, I'm Novogene's dedicated account manager for Pennsylvania. And so that's kind of what brings me in here today. And so I come from a little bit of a clinical background. I had worked for a physician in New York as a, as a scribe. And that experience is kind of what drew my interest to studying diseases and learning about how human health and, and life uh, can be improved. And so my responsibilities basically include advising researchers uh, on their projects, helping them set up the experimental design, um, as well as navigating the actual logistics of getting the project done. And also just overall optimizing the NGS workflows in your lab um, and, and showing you how to use Novagene or leverage Novagene to, to do that. Hi everyone, my name is Kyle Galford. I'm the regional sales manager here at Novagene. Um, a little bit of my background, I uh, went to school at uh, University of Maryland, uh, where my research was in the effects of drugs on regulation of transgenerational gene expression. And so from there, uh, uh, my interest in uh, research and science uh, grew into my role at Novagene. Um, and my current responsibilities include NGS consultation. Uh, to this point, I've uh, consulted and advised on a couple thousand projects. Um, assessing project feasibility is a big part of my job at this point. Uh, administrative coordination uh, so that Novagene uh, can, uh, can work with institutions uh, all over the US uh, and then uh, uh, complex project delivery as well. Uh, so making sure that we can uh, deliver uh, on, uh, on projects that might be uh, a little bit more uh, niche and non-standard. Cool. That one's me. Hi, everybody. I'm Charles. I am the senior product specialist at Novagy. Uh, my research background is in viral ecology. Um, so, you know, we have some people that don't believe viruses are organisms in the room. We're going to be talking about that, so don't shame me. Uh, and then my uh, responsibilities in Novagene are technical advisement, ensuring product viability and sustainability, as well as ensuring um, complex projects get delivered the way that uh, we quote them to. So we may have a mixed room. The topic today is microbes. I'm going to hopefully set the foundation. Like I said, please don't crucify me if I mispronounce your species name uh, or if um, you know, I talk badly about an archaea you are fond of. <laughs> uh, okay, so microbes, uh, bacteria, archaea, fungal, algae, protists, viruses, they're everywhere. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I once heard you know, somebody famous once said, not me, uh, you know, <laughs> remove all the organic matter from a table uh, and leave only the microbes. You'll have the outline of the table there itself. We're constantly surrounded by things we can't see. Why are they important? Well, they help us with uh, nutrition cycling. Uh, they play a key role in our food processing and medical production. Uh, we use them every day in human health, veterinary medicine, in um, environmental tracking, uh, wastewater retention. I know that it's a huge field right now. A lot of gene markers are being used with that. Uh, so what we're gonna do is give you an overview or just make sure we're all on the same page for the definition of these guys on the page. All right. Uh, so I don't know if we have any bacteria people in the room, but I used to be able to smell what bacteria I was dealing with uh, straight, straight out of the incubator. Some smell way worse than others. It's kind of nice. Uh, uh, okay, so yeah, I mean, we have uh, a couple different examples here, right? So E. coli, this is a classic genetic model organism that is studied to this day and is used in a lot of different applications. Uh, I forgot, let's do this. Uh, so we have pneumonia, right? This is a human health impact. Uh, we have leprosy. Uh, surprisingly, if you did not know this, uh, leprosy is only uh, common in about three or so organisms. Humans, armadillos, squirrels, and, and some lesser primates. Uh, so this is why they say do not eat armadillo meat, because you could get leprosy. I do. Thing. Uh, and then, you know, we have salmonella as well, right? Uh, this is huge in our food industry. We hear all the time, we hear all the time about how our uh, 
spinach is spoiled because of salmonella or, or whatever it may be. Uh, protists. So from the kingdom protista, uh, they can be heterotrophic or autotrophic. Some of them are free living, while others are parasites. Uh, they're common in human health, classic examples in genetics. And everybody's favorite uh, crazy cat lady, Toxoplasmodia. So for those of you that don't know this, one of the life cycles of this guy, or sorry, not that guy. <laughs> it's not pictured here. The, one of the life cycle stages uh, for this guy is in cats. And it also is in humans. And so there have been some anecdotal studies. Some of it is, may be true, some of it may not be. But to suggest that Sometimes when people collect cats, it is the influence of Toxoplasmodia saying, I need to go, I need to jump to the next host. Uh, hence the, the reason for the crazy cat lady. Or man, you know. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, then we have uh, this guy here, classic example in um, genetics. All right, now we're gonna talk about algae. So they're plant-like protists. Please do not kill me over the cyanobacteria. Uh, I didn't classify that. Some people get all mad about this being a bacteria, algae, what is it, who knows? Uh, so why is this important? Uh, well, for some of this stuff up here, we're talking about algal blooms. It infects the Great Lakes. This is a huge area of research uh, in the Americas. Uh, also, you know, uh, agriculturally speaking, it causes fish die off, uh, species um, depletion, uh, lack of oxygen, a whole bunch of stuff. We're also in the, uh, I guess this would be the pharmaceutical area or just like the stuff you find at your local aspirin store or vitamin store, I'm not sure. These guys, one of the classic examples, uh, uh, algae, and the reason for this is that they, their life cycles, they change shapes. Uh, and this is not that common. Fungi. Uh, so, in my opinion, some of the best guys in the world, probably because of this, uh, you know, they're used when the production of food, they're used in uh, medical applications, um, they're common in human health problems. Uh, yeah. Viruses. Uh, so they infect everything. And in some cases, there's even evidence to suggest that viruses them infect themselves. So this is one of the world's largest viruses. This is called the Mimi virus. These are its satellite viruses uh, called Sputnik uh, because it's a satellite. Yeah. Uh, and so not much is known about these guys and not a lot of examples have been found in the environment. Here we have a classic, everybody should know this, COVID, right? The impact this has had on our planet has been immense. T4, bacteriophage, one of the first viruses to be studied and characterized. It's a classic example in viral ecology. And then this guy, my favorite, uh, tobacco mosaic virus, first virus ever discovered, uh, virus ever discovered, uh, and is still a classical model used in today. People are shifting to uh, tomato, tomato mosaic virus, uh, so the acronym is still the same though. So. Don't get confused. All right, everything is everywhere and the environment selects. So Bass Becking, uh, back in the day, he had this idea that microbes themselves can be found in almost every environment on this planet. That is not to say that they will thrive in every environment on the planet. The environment itself should give selective pressures for whatever organism is allowed or capable of growing in said environment. Uh, he also helped uh, pioneer the idea of biogeography. Uh, so uh, genetic variation or uh, animal variation across space and time. Another really important thing about microbes, uh, their metabolism. So that helps provide insight to microbe environment indication, indications, indicators, sorry. Uh, and the ecosystem helps to optimize biotechnology applications, such as biofuels and antibiotics. Uh, and it improves the understanding of human health by studying the, the metabolism of some of our pathogenic uh, microbes that infect us. Or even, you know, if we're talking about VET or other systems, it's a good way to understand what they're doing. All right, so the importance of isolating the microbes. Uh, this is going to be a major theme in today's conversation. Uh, 
the way you isolate something will directly impact the sequences you're going to get down the line. So uh, why is it important that we ensure that we're performing adequate isolations? You know, it helps with the discovery of new organisms, uh, some that haven't been pre pre previously uh, isolated. Helps understand microbial diversity. Uh, isolating viruses from different sources, from different locations, can ensure that one, they are from given location, and two, we can understand the genetic potential variation. Also with pathogens, right? Uh, one of the hallmarks for understanding a uh, bacteria or virus is the ability to isolate it and infect it in something else. Um, and it helps us develop new treatments as I uh, highlighted uh, just now. Challenges. So it depends on what system we're working in. Uh, any freshwater people, super easy. Uh, soil people out here, pretty hard. Sludge, retention ponds, hard. Blood, stool, hard things to isolate. Why? Because there are contaminants that will come along with your genetic material. Uh, for soils, it might be some tannins. For blood, it could be a large portion of the host uh, contamination. Um, so it depends on what environment we're pulling these from. Should change our extraction methods. Classic example, Cox postulates. Uh, so first postulate, uh, the micro must be present in all individuals with the disease and absent in the healthy individuals. Uh, so here's one and two. The microbe must be isolated and, uh, sorry, isolated from a disease individual and grown in pure culture. Uh, the purified microbe must cause the disease when inoculated into a healthy organism uh, and subsequent host. And then the fourth postulate to identify, uh, and in this case, this is a, an infecting agent, so we can use this term broadly. Uh, the microbe must be re-isolated from the infected host and identified as the same of the originalized. Okay, so some of us, I think we've heard this classic example of how we define pathogens. But in today's literature, we are identifying and isolating microbes uh, in communities. And so how do we determine if what we are isolating and visualizing genetically is actually a pathogen uh, according to Cox postulates? Well, we have Cox molecular, molecular postulates. And so microbe identification, really what we're just talking about here is using a portion of its DNA or a PCR amplicon. Uh, to assess the microbe associated with the disease. Uh, so if it's present in individuals, absent or less frequent in healthy individuals, uh, how do we demonstrate its pathogenicity, uh, show to cause disease in animals and or uh, vitro systems, and then specific gene associations with diseases. So this is how we will look at uh, what effect is happening in the system bioinformatically. So this just reframes Cox postulates so that we don't have to isolate essentially. Uh, and then just some talking points on, on microbes and, and where to go. Uh, so they're super important uh, and they play a major role in our lives. As I mentioned earlier, they're all around us. Uh, Cox postulates have provided the foundation for a lot of this technology that will be used today. Um, and really more advancements are coming. With the advancements of technology, it allows us to isolate things more efficiently, allows us to sequence faster and cheaper, and allows us to include other things that weren't previously studied together before. So we have metagenomics with a combination of other omics. So transcriptomics, uh, depends on what system you're in, you could be using single cell technology, which has blown up the industry. Um, so really, this is where, where the organisms are headed. 